Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful, that is so inspiring. <laughs> Wonderful live C-SPAN audience. You can see that the great members of the National Constitution Center, like people around the country, are inspired by this nonpartisan mission of constitutional education and believe it is crucially important for citizens to educate themselves about the Constitution so American democracy can thrive and survive. And in this educational mission, we are so excited to be partners with C-SPAN. We had a wonderful collaboration a few years ago, Landmark Cases, which described the human stories behind some of the most important Supreme Court cases of all times. That series was inspired by a comment that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg made at a National Constitution Center event a few years ago where she said how inspiring it would be to hear those human stories so people can relate to the cases and understand the constitutional principles behind them. And that series was such a success that literally by popular demand, we are launching tonight Landmark Case in Season 2, and we have, hooray! And we have a series of new cases, and we are going to talk about the human stories, and to describe them, we have a dream team of respondents. It, and I'm going to introduce them in a second, but first I have to put in a plug for upcoming Constitution Center events. Last week we had this wonderful event with Justice Ginsburg. She came back and talked about uh, gender equality and the future of the Constitution. We have coming up the following events as part of our America's Town Hall program, of which this program is one. Uh, coming up later this uh, month, we have uh, Dean Heather Gerken from Yale Law School, how the right and left can unite around federalism. Then on March 15th, Joseph Ellis and John Meacham will come to discuss renewing the, f the Founders' Promise. And then on March 20th, I'm so excited, this just arrived in the mail on Saturday, the hard copies of this thrilling new book about an <laughs> underappreciated constitutional hero, William Howard Taft. Uh, Judge Doug Ginsburg will come to interview me about our most a uh, judicial president and presidential chief justice, and a man who lost 75 pounds on a paleo diet uh, after he, law he left his unwanted presidency. So those are the exciting events coming up, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, friend, collaborator, the visionary head of C-SPAN, Susan Swain. to self, never follow Jeff Rosen at the podium. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> well, happy President's Day. We're, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court tonight on President's Day, but what really could be more fitting than one of the most important responsibilities that presidents have during their term in office uh, to select judicial appointees to the Supreme Court. So it's really very appropriate for this very special day. Uh, I want to echo Jeff Rosen's comments about our great working relationship. As long as there's been a National Constitution Center, its educational and nonpartisan mission so much mirrors C-SPAN's nearly 40-year-old <coughs> educational nonpartisan uh, public affairs charter, and so it was a wonderful collaboration. In fact, during the 2016 conventions, we set up our studio here and had that beautiful view of Independence Hall. I'm a native Philadelphian, by the way, so it's so nice to be home. Um, <clears throat> As, as uh, Jeff Rosen said, uh, they were kind enough to invite uh, my, my colleagues and I, a few of us, to the uh, National Constitution Center board dinner in Washington a few years ago. And the story that Ruth Bader Ginsburg told was of Loving v. Virginia and how compelling it was to think about Mildred Loving and her husband in their bedroom and the police breaking in because interracial marriage was outlawed in the state of Virginia. That poignant human story just resonated with us and we came back to our office and said, why don't we take on the cases that have dramatic human stories? So working with the folks at the Constitution Center and their great scholarship here, 
we collaborated with, they really advised us on our first set of cases. And uh, it's hard to know in C-SPAN world when we have a hit, frankly, because we don't have any ratings. But we had a lot of good feedback, as did NCC, and the programs are interactive, and so we had a lot of people phoning in and also sending us tweets and Facebook messages. And we liked it. That was the best part of it, because what could be better when you have a job where you're learning something, you work with great people, and you're getting a lot of positive feedback, and that hit on all of those buttons. So when the election was over and we were looking around for another <clears throat> historical project to do, this was just a natural for us. So once again, we have chosen 12 cases and uh, we are starting all the way back in 1819 with McCullough versus Maryland and we're going to end up uh, with 1978 and the Bakke case. And I don't know if you all remember that, we're gonna learn a little bit more, but that was when Alan Bakke uh, challenged affirmative action in the state of California. And we chose cases that are not just historically interesting, but also relevant to our lives today. So you're gonna be looking at uh, cases that deal with wireless warrant tapping and with civil rights and with free speech, issues that we, the right to privacy, things that we are still all talking about and debating in our society today. So you'll learn a bit of 200 years of American uh, judicial history, but you'll also think about how these cases continue to impact our society today. I just wanna say a real quick note about my colleagues because this is a lot of work for us. You know, we're busy covering this Congress who's been keeping us quite active over the past year. And uh, a few of us have taken this on as a bit of a labor of love. Pardon the glasses for a little bit here. But my colleagues are here and could, oops, excuse me, could you just wave your hand so people see who you are? Mark Farkas is our executive producer for special projects. <laughs> Ben O'Connell is going to be producing this series for us as senior producer. Uh, Nate Hurst is next to him, and he's going to be working with us on a week-to-week -week basis to line up all the guests and the video. We have two folks who are at home in Washington. Randy Rohrbacher is one of our field crew people, and we are sending him out, and this goes to the people stories. He's going on location to the personal stories, the hometowns of where these cases took place, and getting video, uh, the, for example, visiting Chinatown for Yik Wo, and uh, going to Des Moines for Tinker versus Des Moines School District. So you'll see the places where these cases actually took place. and then. For Finally, Yvette Lucero, who's going to be our production assistant. And we also have a big technical crew. Thanks to all of you. I'm not going to name all of your names. Okay, so the series starts next Monday night um, at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be live for 90 minutes, and we will go for 12 weeks. Each case gets its own program. So we're hoping so much to have you in our audience. Phone in with questions or send us a Facebook comment and make it interactive because just as tonight, your questions really make the discussion. So thanks for helping us kick it off tonight. Thank you for your enthusiasm and being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Rosen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, Susan is a masterful moderator, and it's such a pleasure to learn with her about these incredible cases. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a treat. I hope this will be a concentrated constitutional feast, an hour or so where we have two of America's leading experts on the Constitution from different perspectives to help take us through these cases, to learn together, and to spread the light. Akilah Mar is America's teacher of the Constitution. He was my teacher of the Constitution. He was my first teacher in law school, and he has spread his wisdom and knowledge to me and to thousands and hundreds of thousands of others versus, um, uh, uh, by, by means of uh, wonderful technologies. He's the author of many books, including The Constitution Today, Timeless Lessons for the Issues of Our Era. He is Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale, and he is America's leading exponent of a constitutional methodology that some have called the new textualism or uh, 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 originalism for liberals that argues that the text and history of the Constitution uh, honestly interpreted should lead to results of different political valences. And joining him in this incredible discussion is Michael Stokes Paulson. He's a distinguished university chair and professor of law at the University of St. Thomas, author of num numerous books, including The Constitution and Introduction, which I have here, which Justice Samuel Alito called solid, reliable, interesting, informative, and a lively tour of the Constitution. 
Um, he, and he uh, uh, approaches things, according to Justice Alito, from a more Hamiltonian and originalist uh, uh, perspective, uh, from a more conservative point of view. And I just learned in the green room that Akil and Mike were law school roommates. <laughs> And what do you imagine that these two brilliant <laughs> scholars of the Constitution did in law school? Well, I not, wasn't surprised to learn they debated the Constitution so heatedly that they would follow each other into the communal restrooms when they were brushing their teeth. And Mike would argue that Akil was a wild-eyed living constitutionalist, and Akil called Mike a rigid originalist. And I, don't, I hope your teeth got brushed, but I'm sure the debate was absolutely fascinating. And we're going to continue it tonight. <laughs> Okay, let us jump right in, because we have no, uh, we, we, we have to use every moment of this precious time to learn together. And we're gonna begin with McCullough and Maryland, uh, 1819. I need my constitutional reading glasses, and I think we need the text of Article One. If someone, there's, there, may, there may be a clicker, oh, here it is. I haven't tried it, but let's see if it works, okay. Wonderful. The Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into, into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States. It's 1816. The second bank of the U.S. is created here in Philadelphia. There are branches and a bunch of cities, including Baltimore. In 1818, the Maryland legislature passes a bill taxing out-of-state banks and uh, the question is, does Congress have the authority to establish the bank? Did Maryland law unconstitutionally interfere with congressional powers? <laughs> Chief Justice Marshall's <clears throat> totemically important opinion for the court has many memorable lines, including that the power to tax involves the power to destroy. And he also says that unlike the Articles of Confederation, the 10th Amendment to the Constitution uh, doesn't include the word expressly. And this is evidence that the Constitution doesn't limit Congress to doing only those things specifically listed in Article I. Akil, you have called McCullough the most central case in our constitutional canon, and you have said, I teach my students McCullough and Maryland before Marbury versus Madison, precisely because I think McCullough is a better exemplar of legal craft. Why is McCullough so important, and what do you want our audience to know about it? So constitutional law isn't just about what the rules are, what Congress can do, what Congress can't do, what the president can and can't do. The what questions are important, but even more important probably is the how question. How do you do constitutional law? How do you make a constitutional argument? What counts? Um, only judicial precedent? What about text? What about the history, the original intent of the Constitution? What about the structure of the Constitution as a whole? And McCulloch is a beautiful example of all the different tools and techniques of proper constitutional analysis, uh, holistic constitutional analysis being brought to bear. So if I want to teach my students more than anything else how to do constitutional law, how to make arguments, McCulloch is a great place to start. Wow. Uh, Mike, you also have had high praise for McCulloch. And in this book, The Constitution, in introduction, you say that uh, it has relevance for the court's decision to uphold the Affordable Care Act. Tell us about how it's come to stand for a broad interpretation of national power, which has prevailed, although Jackson's veto stands for the proposition that the separate branches have the power to interpret the Constitution on their own. Well, you wouldn't think that a t case about a taxing of a bank would be such exciting uh, <laughs> lore, but it, but it really is. This is a controversy that goes to the root of how broad the national government's powers are to legislate for the country. And it goes back to Hamilton versus Jefferson. I think I've seen this debate between Hamilton and Jefferson recreated in the musical Hamilton, right? I won't do any rap here. <laughs> do it. But, John Marshall, in upholding the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States, basically plagiarizes arguments that Alexander Hamilton made to George Washington to convince him that the powers granted to Congress should be construed basically for all they're worth. Right? That the idea of the necessary and proper clause means not that there are powers beyond the Constitution, but that the Constitution grants Congress a broad sphere of, sphere of powers. The power to create a national bank isn't one of the specifically enumerated powers. 
but their powers to regulate commerce, to regulate commercial affairs, to regulate banking, bankruptcy. And so the creation of a Bank of the United States was necessary and proper for carrying into execution the other broad grants of powers. And that really, Akil's right, that really is foundational to nearly everything that Congress has done. Now, now many people think Congress has gone too far, but all of today's controversies in terms of how broad Congress's powers are really go back to the precedent of McCulloch versus Maryland. There, there's another aspect of the case too, which is the one where you hear this line, the power to tax is the power to destroy. The state was taxing the operations of the Bank of the United States. If the bank, a federal instrumentality, is constitutional, then a state can't interfere with it. Under the, national, under the supremacy clause of the Constitution, national law beats inconsistent state law. And I think McCulloch is a wonderful case. It's foundational for not only the, how broad Congress's powers are, but the relationship between the states and the national government. In fact, you can see the roots of Lincoln's argument against secession in the argument why it is unconstitutional for the states to interfere with the operations of the nation. Wow, I'm so tempted to take another round on this. I just want to make sure we get through all 12 cases. <laughs> Good but luck with that, Jeff. <laughs> I, I'm, going to resist, I'm going to resist temptation, and we'll leave time for questions um, afterward, and we can come back if we need to. OK, it's time for another amendment and a really important case. And this is a big one. Ladies and gentlemen, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution turns 150 this July. It is the cornerstone of the constitutional achievement of the Civil War. Uh, after Lincoln promised a new birth of freedom at Gettysburg. It says, let's read it and think about each of these clauses. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. That's the privileges or immunities clause. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That's the due process clause. Nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the Equal Protection of the Laws. That's the Equal Protection Clause. And the case we're talking about now is the Civil Rights Cases, 1883. The um, Civil War is over. It's time for Reconstruction. And the centerpiece of the achievement of Reconstruction is the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Charles Sumner, the author of the bill, is so committed to this bill, which would forbid discrimination in places of public accommodation, that on his deathbed he says, my bill, my bill, don't let them forget my bill. <sighs> And then he expires, <laughs> and the bill passes, and yet, just a few years later, in 1883, the Supreme Court strikes it down and holds it unconstitutionally, exceeds Congress's authority under the 14th Amendment. There's an amazing human story in this case that I'm sure we'll tell in the series, but Justice John Marshall Harlan, who writes the famous dissent, has writer's block. He doesn't know what to say, although he's so upset by this evisceration of the 14th Amendment. His wife finds at the Supreme Court the silver inkwell where Chief Justice Roger Taney wrote the Dred Scott decision, infamously saying that African Americans had no rights which white people were bound to respect, the very case that the amendment in part was designed to repudiate. She puts the inkwell on Harlan's desk. They come home from church. He finds the inkwell, realizes that it's Taney's, and suddenly, as if overcome by spirit, he <laughs> writes this spectacular dissent and predicts uh, that someday the decision will be viewed in infamy. That's the civil rights cases. Akil, there's so much to say about this, but I want the audience to understand the legal stakes. On what grounds did the majority hold that Congress lacked the power to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1875, and what was the grounds for Harlan's dissent? So start with Harlan's dissent. Um, what a name, John Marshall Harlan. Back to John Marshall, and I think the dissent better challenge, uh, channeled John Marshall, because what did John Marshall say in McCulloch? Well, as Mike told you, Congress should have broad power. The Constitution doesn't say bank, doesn't say Air Force, doesn't say individual mandate, but Congress should have broad power when actually implementing the great purposes for which the Constitution was established. At the founding, what's that purpose? national security above all, and a bank is useful for national security. To, uh, banks are very helpful to win wars, um, and Marshall mentions that in McCulloch. Now, after the Civil War, the federal government is basically given a new 
competence, a, a, a new focus, civil rights. The 13th Amendment ends slavery, um, and the second clause says Congress shall have power. Um, and the language uses to, to uh, Congress shall have power to pass appropriate legislation. The word appropriate is actually taken from McCulloch versus Maryland. So the framers of the 13th Amendment, ending slavery, want Congress to have broad power to end slavery. The framers of the 14th Amendment have this language, but they also have language at the end of the 14th Amendment saying Congress shall have broad McCulloch power. So John Marshall Harlan says, what was the basic problem that generated the Reconstruction Amendments? It was racism in America. And Congress has broad power to try to end racism. Um, this sentence that we have up on screen says, no state shall. But right before that sentence um, is uh, one more uh, that's actually pretty important. All persons born or naturalized in the United States uh, 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 and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Anyone born in the United States is born a citizen, born an equal citizen. We're all born equal. We're all created equal. That's Lincoln's idea at Gettysburg, channeling Jefferson. And if we're all born equal, and Congress has power to enforce this, Harlan says Congress should be able to prohibit race discrimination in public accommodations, hotels, theaters, all the rest. So Harlan says, let's read congressional power broadly in the spirit of John Marshall and McCulloch reading an amendment that actually borrowed language from McCulloch, the word appropriate. What does the majority say in response? Gee, uh, public accommodations, these are owned by private persons, hotels, theaters, inns, um, railroads. They're not the government. It says no state shall, and, and you, Congress doesn't have broad power to regulate uh, non-state actors. But remember, Harlan says, oh, the 14th Amendment doesn't just say no state shall. It says everyone's born a citizen. That sentence doesn't say no state shall. John Marshall told us to construe federal power broadly, but the court, eight to one, rejects that. Um, and that's why in um, my lifetime and the lifetime of some of you, Congress in effect needed to repass Sumner's bill. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 basically becomes the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, that Lyndon Johnson helps push through um, in honor of Martin King and, and John, the martyr John, martyr John Kennedy. And this time the Supreme Court upholds it in the 1960s. Mike, Akil just described so well how the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment doesn't have a state action requirement. But Harlan also said that theaters and public accommodations are essentially uh, have the nature of quasi-public entities, even though they're privately owned. So do conservatives believe that the majority was right or Harlan was right in the civil rights cases? Well, I don't know that I can speak for all conservatives here because I actually think that the civil rights cases were wrongly decided. I'm actually with Akil on that result. I have a more Hamiltonian view of the scope of enumerated powers. Here's the argument that is usually raised, and Akil captured this, I think, pretty well, is that the 14th Amendment is a restriction on what state governments can do. Okay? The 13th Amendment prohibited slavery and could reach private conduct. And one of the arguments for sustaining the civil rights case, the anti-discrimination laws, was that it was enforcing the prohibition on slavery. And I think the Supreme Court rightly said, well, that is going beyond prohibiting slavery. The prohibiting, the discrimination is something different from slavery and the power to outlaw slavery and to enforce the ban on slavery doesn't get you all the way there. I think the argument that inns, motels, railroads were public accommodations and therefore part of the government is wrong. You know? And I think that most, uh, the, the, the civil rights cases is actually correctly the origin of the idea that the 14th Amendment is a restriction on what state governments can do, and there has to be something that really is attributable to the actions of the state. Here's where I end up dis disagreeing with the result of the Supreme Court. Congress has the power to, in to pass laws enforcing the prohibition on states denying equal protection. There's a sense in which the state's failure to protect equal rights 
is an affirmative ground on which Congress could prohibit the failure. Congress could step in and remedy, it could pick up where the states have dropped off. And I think that's the most persuasive reason for thinking that the majority opinion in the civil rights cases uh, is actually wrong. I, I like Akhil's point that basically the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is a Civil Rights Act of 1875 revisited or reloaded as it were. And it's interesting that the power on which the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was sustained was the commerce power, that it was necessary and proper to carry into effect the commerce power, which is an argument they rejected or said could, would not have been plausible in 1883. It's interesting that the enforcement of civil rights ultimately rests on the power of Congress to regulate private commercial conduct and not the power to enforce equal protection of the laws. Quite an irony. Uh, it is indeed an irony, and thank you for relating the uh, Commerce Clause of Article I, which we read for, for, uh, to the 14th Amendment. All right, our next case is Yikwo and Hopkins. 1886, this is a mere three years after the civil rights cases. Generally, this is not a period in which the uh, cause of racial equality uh, has many victories before the Supreme Court, but Yikwo is an exception. It strikes down laws aimed at closing uh, uh, laundries that are owned by uh, Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants in San Francisco. It was the first case to use the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It's a unanimous decision, and it's a case where um, there's uh, lots uh, of uh, migration by uh, Chinese uh, uh, people to, to the US during the gold rush. The city of San Francisco wants to close down uh, laundries and passes this law which gives a board total discretion over who gets a permit to issue laundries. And although workers of Chinese descent have 89% of the laundries, they don't get a single permit. And the Supreme Court says that this is an unequal enforcement of the law which violates the Equal Protection Clause despite the law's impartial wording. And the famous words from Yik Wo are, if the law is applied and administered by public authorities with an evil eye and an unequal hand, so as practically to make unjust and illegal discriminations between persons in similar circumstances, the denial of equal justice is still within the prohibition of the Constitution. Akil, the significance of Yikwo and how on earth did the people, the side of equality win during this period when it had so few victories? One thing I'd like everyone to notice, since we have this language up on the screen, is Privileges and immunities are protections for citizens. Um, what are basic privileges and immunities? Things that are really fundamental and important. I would say free speech, free press, free exercise of religion, stuff in the Bill of Rights. But if it's stuff in the Bill of Rights, you might say, Professor, wouldn't that include due process? Well, yeah, it would. Well, then why do they say due process? Well, here's why. Because if you look carefully, Due process protects not just citizens, but persons. That would be aliens, President Trump. I mean, um, just um, uh, my, my fellow citizens here. <laughs> on a nonpartisan basis. I know, non <laughs> you know, the center is supposed to be nonpartisan. I don't know if I have to be. You know, that's why, <laughs> that's why we have Brother Paulson. Yes, he'll get you. Um, but, um, but this was an amendment not just about protecting citizens' rights, but protecting aliens' rights. That's why the word person appears there. Uh, and, and in San Francisco, some of the folks who were affected were actually not U.S. citizens. They happened to be immigrants from China. Um, uh, and uh, this, uh, and, and we today think what a violation of equal protection is, is where the law itself says whites are treated differently from, from blacks or men from women. We read it as if it says, you know, you're entitled to the protection of equal laws. And, and that's key, but it actually, when you read it with care, it says the equal protection of the laws, and in part, it's about whatever laws do exist have to be enforced in an even-handed way, and this law wasn't. On its face, it didn't say anything about race, but in the application, the government was treating um, people with yellow skin, different than people with white skin, people of Chinese ancestry, different from other types, and that's this language of uh, evil eye and unequal hand. They were being denied really the equal protection of law because it was an even-handed law on its face, 
but it was being applied in a completely uneven, unequal way. Mike, any dispute about the correctness of Yikwo, which was unanimous? And what is the significance today of this holding that even a formally neutral law may be unconstitutional if it's infected by a discriminatory intent? No disagreement at all. Um, this is a case, oddly, about architecture. The, uh, the San Francisco ordinance prohibited or required a special license if you operated a, li uh, a laundry in a wooden building. Right? in a wooden building. The problem was in San Francisco at the time, before the turn of the century, almost all the buildings were wooden. And the overwhelming number of Chinese operated laundries were in wooden buildings. And then the law itself, as Akil pointed out and Jeff pointed out, was neutral on its face. But the problem was that it was enforced in a blatantly discriminatory manner that basically only one Chinese laundry out of hundreds was granted permission to continue to operate. And Yik uh, defied the law, was fined $10, refused to pay the fine, and then had to, he was actually, I believe, imprisoned, and he brought a writ of habeas corpus, which is how it got up to the Supreme Court. I love the principle that a law can be neutral on its face, but if it's discriminatorily enforced, that can render an otherwise seemingly valid law unconstitutional. It's now time, ladies and gentlemen, for Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. Uh, who has heard of Plessy versus Ferguson? <laughs> All right, so we know this infamous decision which uh, upheld uh, a uh, law which required separate but equal, supposedly, railroad cars. And if the civil rights cases remarked, uh, represented the end of uh, the high point of Reconstruction. Plessy versus Ferguson issues in the Jim Crow era when Southern states and others really <clears throat> begin to uh, mandate uh, a kind of American apartheid. And the case is so important because it was overturned in Brown versus Board of Education where um, Thurgood Marshall read Justice John Marshall's Harlan dissenting opinion in Plessy for inspiration before he argued Plessy versus Ferguson. And John Marshall Harlan's dissenting opinion uh, has come to be uh, celebrated as one of the greatest uh, uh, prescient prophetic statements of liberty in, uh, and equality in constitutional history. I'm going to read from it because it is jarring at the beginning. Harlan begins by making what would strike us as nativist comments about uh, Chinese Americans, suggesting that he shared some of the anti-immigrant bias. And then he goes on to say something about white people. He says, the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country. So it is in terms of prestige and achievements and education and wealth and power. So I doubt not it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage and holds fast to its principles of constitutional liberty. A rather jarring beginning. But then he goes on to say, but in view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior, dominant, ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here, C-A-S-T-E. And here are the famous words, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens in respect of civil rights. All citizens are equal before the law. Wow, okay, Akil, help us unpack this jarring combination of nativism and white uh, pride with a declaration of equal equality when it comes to civil rights, but not apparently political and social rights. Let's connect dots. All citizens are equal before the law. What language is he channeling? Actually not equal protection, which is about persons, but the missing sentence here that everyone born in America is born a citizen and therefore an equal citizen. So that first sentence which overruled Dred Scott is what he's channeling. What's his name? John Marshall Harlan. Um, he's channeling in a way, of course, um, John Marshall because remember, he thought that the civil rights cases of 1883 were wrongly decided. He was the great dissenter. He thought Congress could prohibit race discrimination in railroads. If the Supreme Court had upheld that law, Plessy would be a simple preemption case, just as Mike told you before. When the federal government says one thing, states can't do the other thing. If the federal government creates a bank, states can't destroy it. 
Well, if the federal government says no race discrimination in railroads, this was a state law that was undermining that. So if Harlan had simply been followed in the civil rights cases of 1883, the congressional law would have been in place. This is nice and easy. Congress has, in effect, said, already said, no race discrimination in railroads. But you see, he lost in the civil rights cases of 1883. So, but he was channeling John Marshall, saying Congress should be allowed to prohibit this. And who is he anticipating? Thurgood Marshall, as you said, who, who reads Plessy versus Ferguson and his great dissent, um, which, in effect, becomes the law in Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and, um, and I think it's maybe even in this case where he um, uh, is, uh, uh, does use um, uh, the inkwell that, that, uh, that um, uh, Roger Tawney had used in Dred Scott. Here's what he says, and it's amazing. It's like the equivalent of Babe Ruth's called shot. Remember, it's 8-1. He's alone in dissent. And he says, I predict that this case will come to be seen as another Dred Scott. Think about the audacity of someone alone in dissent to say it and to have been proved right by history. Because we do think, I think today, that his dissent is, is um, uh, really the, the right approach. But if you're with him in Plessy, and I hope you all are, then I think we should be with him, as Mike and I are, in the civil rights cases of 1883. And today's Supreme Court cites the civil rights cases with 1883 with strong approval. And I think, shame on them. Mike, I want our audience to understand what Justice Brown's majority opinion. That was his name, Justice says, Brown. Justice, the, the resonances are deep. And Justice Brown said, if anyone objects to separate but equal, that's just the fault of African Americans. It's nothing inherent in the segregation itself. And <clears throat> what was the uh, power of Justice Harlan's response that everyone knows what the real purpose of segregation was, namely to degrade and humiliate African Americans? And I'm just going to ask you, was Harlan clearly right? Are, are there still some uh, conservatives uh, or originalists who think that on originalist grounds um, the majority was right? No, Harlan was clearly right, and Plessy is one of the most clearly wrong cases ever decided by the Supreme Court. And it is instructive that it's eight to one, and that it's possible for a Supreme Court decision to have enormous public support and enormous majority support of the justices and still be a flagrantly mistaken understanding of the Constitution. I, I think one of the lessons of Plessy versus Ferguson. This is 1896, right? Civil War ends in 1865, <clears throat> and during the Reconstruction period, the early interpretations of the 14th Amendment are that the law must be the same for the black and for the white. I think that line comes from a case called Strouder versus West Virginia, that there can be no separation, distinction, discrimination between the races as a matter of law. What's instructive is that by the 1890s, that idea is lost to the Supreme Court. And here I might provoke an, an, uh, an angry response from Akil. Because the Supreme Court feels that the meaning of the words of the Constitution must change with the social mores at the time. Now, that's a very appealing notion, but look how the social mores changed. And much of the reasoning of Justice Brown's opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson is that we must read the Constitution to be socially reasonable and in tune with the times. And the tune of the times had become segregationist. It takes Brown versus Board of Education, uh, what, 70 some years later to overrule that precedent on the basis of the fact that you know, we all know that the law should be the same for everyone. I think the lesson of Brown versus Board of Education, the ultimate lesson, is the same as the good line in uh, Justice Harlan's dissent, which is that our Constitution is colorblind. Any time that the government categorizes, distinguishes, or separates on the basis of race, that should be regarded as presumptively unconstitutional. I think that was the original meaning. If you're a good original meaning conservative, you want to adhere to what the Civil War era and Reconstruction Congress actually adopted. And that was intended to be a flat prohibition on racial discrimination of any sort. Great. Well, we will return to that uh, 
important principle when we get to the Bakke case in uh, just a bit. But we now, in our uh, thrilling tour of the Constitution, are going to fast forward to 1965 and to Griswold versus Connecticut. Gosh, this is just a greatest hits tour of the <laughs> Constitution. And it is so exciting to be able to introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, to this crucial case involving the right to privacy, the case that became the foundation for Roe versus Wade. So it's the late 1960s, and Connecticut is the only state in the nation that still bans the use of contraceptives for married couples. You can learn about the human stories behind this case in David Garrow's superb book about the right to privacy, where he describes uh, interplays between P.T. Barnum and Catherine Hepburn's mother and <laughs> Estelle Griswold, who's the executive director of Planned Parenthood in Connecticut. We'll learn all about those on the episode. But the constitutional question is, does the Constitution protect a right of marital privacy against state restrictions on a couple's ability to be counseled? Okay, you can teach a whole constitutional law case about Griswold, but there are uh, at least uh, three basic arguments for striking down the law. Justice William O. Douglas has a very freewheeling opinion for the majority that's famous for its invocation of penumbras formed by emanations from the various different parts of the Constitution, which he says coalesce into a free-floating right to privacy. I heard a little chuckle in the audience, and there was a chuckle among the law clerks as well when they first read Douglas's draft, because it seemed so loosey-goosey, and Justice Hugo Black said, the right of married couples to associate in bed is new to me, basically. He thought that Douglas was being too freewheeling and conflating various parts of privacy in the first, se the second, third, fourth, uh, all the various amendments, the Fifth Amendments, and creating a, a free-floating right of privacy. Justice John Marshall Harlan II, we're hearing a lot of John Marshall Harlan's here, has a narrower opinion. Grandson of the first. Grandson of the first and uh, a great Burkean conservative says that uh, there's a right of spatial privacy in the home, perhaps rooted in the Fourth Amendment, and it might be really intrusive to enforce these marital privacy laws. You'd have to break into the home in ways that might violate the spirit of the Fourth Amendment. And then there's also a suggestion in Justice Harlan's opinion that this law is so unusual, it's the only one of its kind in the country, that the history and traditions of the country have evolved in a way that has recognized marital privacy as a right under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So that's my quick summary. Akhil, you'll do much better. Unpack the various reasons and tell us which, if any, you find most persuasive or if you have a different approach to the case. So you mentioned this word evolve and them's fighting words for some folks um, uh, <laughs> who um, uh, uh, insist that actually we, we uh, that the Constitution doesn't quite e evolve. Um, John Marshall, some people say when he said, we must never forget it is a constitution we are expounding. Some people say, oh, he's, he's talking about how it evolves. John Marshall didn't believe in evolution. Uh, Darwin hasn't written The Origin of the Species um, or done The Voyage of the Beagle in 1819. John Marshall believed that the animals entered the ark two by two, so he's not an evolutionist. Um, and, and Mike says we shouldn't be. I'm halfway in between. Here's the thought. If the Constitution prohibits something, if there's a right in the Constitution, then we have to, we should stick by that. It says equal, we should always do equal, even if social mores change by the time of Plessy. It says equal, and gosh darn it, segregation isn't equal. But the Constitution also says, so I don't think we should ever evolve away from core rights. But the Constitution in the Ninth Amendment when it comes to the federal government, in the Privileges or Immunities Clause when it comes to the 14th Amendment, gestures toward unenumerated rights. There may be more rights than are specifically mentioned, never less, but more. And then the question is, how do you find those extra ones, those additional ones? Equal means equal, and plusy ain't equal, so the, the, the segregation wasn't equal, so it's invalidated. But if there are more rights, how do we find them? And here, John Marshall Harlan, the younger, the grandson, did have an idea. We could look at state practices. We could look at state constitutions. And 
um, in on the facts of Griswold, no state other than my home state of Connecticut had made it a crime for married couples to use contraception in the home. So that was uh, an unenumerated right. We could look to the Declaration of Independence and state practices and state constitutions to find more rights rather than less. And the person, by the way, who first taught me that the key passage was John Marshall Harlan, the Younger's um, statement that no state other than Connecticut did this, and that's why it was it, it is a clear right. It was an article in the New Republic by one of my former students <laughs> named Jeff Rosen. Oh. <laughs> you, uh, it was you, Akil, who uh, inspired me to dig into the history of the Ninth Amendment and also come up with a principled means of identifying which rights are unenumerated. Because simply saying that there are some rights that are protected even though they're not written down doesn't tell you how to identify those rights. And that's why it's so important, ladies and gentlemen, and C-SPAN viewers, that you learn about the methodologies of constitutional interpretation and decide which one you find most persuasive. So Mike, uh, Griswold has been famously criticized by conservatives from Robert Bork who said that the Ninth Amendment should be treated as if it had an ink blot over it, to uh, Supreme Court nominees until Chief Justice John Roberts, who said that it was correct, and I think Justice Alito said it was correct. So I really need you to tell our audience, do you think Griswold is correct under any uh, approach? And if so, which approach do you think is correct? Or was it just flatly wrong? Uh-oh. <clears throat> this one's going to keep me from being confirmed to the Supreme Court someday. <clears throat> I actually think Griswold is wrongly decided. Now, I actually agree with the political result, but one of the things that I try to get my students to do is to not read the Constitution through the lens of their political beliefs, right? And I try to get them to come to the realization that the Constitution doesn't grant a right to everything you think would be a good idea and doesn't prohibit everything that's a bad idea, that the text has an objective meaning and that that's our bedrock and our foundation of rights. I think Griswold is a classic case of a result <clears throat> seeking a persuasive reason and not finding it. Uh, in Justice Douglas's opinion, he cites the First Amendment freedom of speech and association as a prop for the right to contraception. That's stretching things. He finds the Third Amendment right to not have soldiers quartered in your home? Well, that sort of supports it too. The Fourth Amendment prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizures, and he keeps going. The Fifth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, which is really a simple rule that the existence of a Bill of Rights doesn't take away your state law rights. And he sort of extrapolates to the idea that this would be a really good right. Okay? <laughs> now, one of the best, one of, one of the standard lawyer tricks that you're all taught is if the text doesn't support you, you sort of abstract from the text a bigger principle. And then you interpret the principle and you read it back into the text in order to produce the result you like. It's hand waving, it's lawyers like, if a lawyer is doing that, hold on to your wallet or your purse because they're trying to pick your pocket. I think that as a descriptive matter, nobody nominated to the Supreme Court today conservative, liberal, would ever say that Griswold is wrongly decided. So I'm safe from that job, at least. It's OK, I, do, I have a decent job, as it is. Um, <clears throat> but it is interesting how the popularity of the result has driven, and to some extent, distorted our approach to constitutional reasoning. Now, most people, 99%, would actually support the result in Griswold versus Connecticut. But I think Jeff is right that that becomes a critical prop for the creation of a broad ranging right to privacy, even to creating an abortion right. And at that point, people say, now, now wait a minute. Where did this right to abortion come from? The Ninth Amendment? The First Amendment? How does privacy sustain a constitutional right to abortion? And I think by the time you get to Roe versus Wade in 1973, you look back at Griswold in 1965 and say, this is probably where constitutional reasoning took a turn decisively toward a policy-driven as opposed to a text-driven approach to constitutional law. Much more to say about Griswold, but thank you for your courage in embracing a result that, as you say, no nominee to the Supreme Court is willing to do today. And ladies and gentlemen, learn about those methodologies, be able to distinguish between the Douglas approach, 
the Harlan uh, focus on the Fourth Amendment and the uh, idea that certain outlier laws might be striked down, that's an approach called desuetude. It's a fancy SAT word, but uh, Guido Calabresi from Yale Law School has said that when some books, some laws are on the books and they're total outliers, then the history and traditions have evolved in a way that means that they should be able to be strike, struck down or entertain the possibility that Mike is right and that Griswold uh, was simply bad constitutional law. Uh, from contraception, we now turn to the death penalty. And uh, we are going to talk about a case called Gregg versus Georgia from 1976. The story of the death penalty and its uh, fate before the Supreme Court is such a dramatic one because the Supreme Court moves within the space of less than a decade from holding in the Furman and Georgia case in 1972 that the death penalty is categorically unconstitutional to just a few years later, partly because of the backlash against that decision, to holding in Gregg that the Georgia death penalty statute is constitutional and is not cruel or unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment. Akhil, you uh, write about the Furman case and the Gregg case in America's Unwritten Constitution, and you say it's an illustrative case study. Mm -hmm. In the late 1960s, actual executions dropped to zero, and the courts seemed to hold the death penalty unconstitutional, but Congress and 35 states pushed back, and the court responded in Gregg by upholding the death penalty. Tell us more about that. And was it right for the court to be so apparently responsive to this, to the winds of public opinion? So let's again connect dots. I think Griswold is right. I think Roe is very problematic. What are some differences? Here's one. In Griswold, there was one state, a weird outlier state, that made it a crime for married couples to use contraception. And the court struck down a, an odd law that was really out of sync with basically national norms, which um, helped generate an idea of what's fundamental in America. That was what I learned from you, Jeff. In, in a row, the court struck down the extant laws of about 48 of the 50 states. About 48 or so of the states were non-Row compliant. Only New York of all the states actually met Row standards. So one case, striking down one law. Um, another case, all the laws are unconstitutional. And boy, if you're doing that, you better be able to show something pretty clearly in the Constitution. Now, let's think about the death penalty. The Constitution uses a word unusual, cruel and unusual punishment. Well, that might be an invitation to count. Uh, at the time of the founding, it's not unusual to uh, put the pickpockets to death. Um, but over time, actually, a whole bunch of states say, gee, that seems a bit extreme. And at a certain point, putting pickpockets to death becomes unusual and therefore maybe cruel and unusual and therefore maybe unconstitutional. Well, in 1972, there actually was a year in which no one was executed in America. Now, people were convicted of, of death penalty offenses. There were lots of people on death row, but no one was executed. And the court thought, ah, oh, we are civilized now. It's become unusual. We actually proclaim that it's unconstitutional. That was 1972, doing a counting approach. Well, one of the reasons no one was being executed is the courts had made it very difficult to, to impose these capital punishments. And actually, the American people weren't quite there. And they pushed back tremendously after the Furman case in 1972 with a whole round of new capital punishment laws. And the court did backtrack in 1976. But I think, actually, plausibly, because if the point is to look at actual state practices, is a certain practice genuinely unusual? Um, once a whole bunch of states very recently, not a long time ago, but very recently, have passed new death penalty statutes. That's new information and evidence about kind of a national ideas about what's fundamental or not. So counting is actually a way of sometimes thinking about two things. One, unenumerated rights. If, if something's in the Constitution, you enforce it whether it's popular or not. I'm with Brother Paulson on that. It's, it's you know, plus it's not equal, so it's unconstitutional. But if it's not an enumerated right, I believe there are unenumerated rights, and we can look at state practice for that. And sometimes the text of the Constitution itself may invite us to look at actual practice, a word like unusual. Uh, maybe a word like reasonable um, might invite um, recourse to, to uh, social norms. But, but anyway, that's the answer. Great. 
my crucial question, which goes back to your law school toothbrush debates with Akhil. Can the Constitution evolve when it comes to the Eighth Amendment? The late Justice Scalia said that when deciding whether a practice is cruel or unusual under the Eighth Amendment, it might be appropriate to look at state constitutions and to see whether states had come to recognize a practice as unconstitutional today that wasn't at the time of the framing. In that sense, is there any uh, state vote counting that was appropriate for the court between Gregg and uh, Furman, or uh, does the meaning of the Eighth Amendment remain unchanged, and should it be interpreted in light of the founding era? That's a great question, and actually a very hard question. Now, if, if you're a good, faithful, original meaning constitutional interpreter, you still recognize that there are some provisions of the Constitution that have a really relatively clear, determinate meaning. Like, what is the president has to be 35 years of age. 35 means probably 35. <laughs> there are other provisions of the Constitution that if you're faithful to the original meaning, the original meaning has a range or might articulate a standard as opposed to a strict rule. I think it's an interesting question, and I'm not an expert on the Eighth Amendment. I think it's an interesting question whether cruel and unusual punishment was a term of art that had a limited specific meaning. I've read good arguments that it is a prohibition on cruel innovations, that that was the understanding of it. If you think that cruel and unusual means that it is an unusual penalty today, then I think there is room consistent with the original meaning for a practice to have become unusual when it wasn't unusual before. I recoil a little bit about the Supreme Court in 1972 counting heads one direction and then in 1976 counting a social backlash and changing the interpretation of the Constitution. There's something unsettling about a wet finger to the wind, the constitutional, you know, the Supreme Court does follow the election returns, right? Um, still, that, that wouldn't be a possibility I would exclude for a provision that is explicitly a standard. If the framers in adopting a constitutional provision actually intended or meant for that provision to create some running room and for different interpretations over time, then I think it is actually conservative, faithful to the Constitution, to accord that running room different, different results at different times. Thank you for that. Uh, affirmative action. Are you, are, you, are you paying attention, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Contraception, the death penalty, and now it's time for Nothing affirmative action. To. This is why this is why constitutional law is so crucial and exciting and important to study. And the case we're going to talk about is Regents of California versus Baki. It's 1978, and Alan Baki uh, sues the University of California after he's denied admission to the medical school after discovering the school reserved seats for people of color. He charged reverse discrimination, and the question is, is this a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause and of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, as Akhil said earlier, vindicates the promise of the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and forbids discrimination on the basis of race. There's no single majority opinion. Four of the justices say any racial quota system violates the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, the dissenters say that the use of race is okay in higher education uh, as long as it's used to help African Americans rather than to stigmatize or degrade them. And the key vote is cast by Justice Lewis Powell, who says that rigid racial quotas are a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, but using race as a plus factor may be permissible because intellectual diversity, especially in the university arena, is a permissible goal under the First Amendment, and taking race into account, as Harvard College did, was permissible. Akhil, uh, there was a muddled opinion. Who, if anyone, was right? And if you were writing Baki, what grounds for upholding affirmative action would you give? I, I used to, when I was young, make you know, <laughs> fun of, uh, of Justice Powell. You know, pluses are okay, quotas aren't, but of course we know in the long run these pluses approximate quotas. Um, 
you know, just like when I was in, uh, uh, 20 years old, I used to probably say, mouth off about my father or something. You know, as I've gotten older, my dad's gotten a lot smarter, and I feel the same way about Justice Powell. As I've gotten older, he's gotten a lot smarter. Um, this um, was uh, maybe the sweet spot um, uh, in a very difficult cultural domain. What does it mean for a system to be equal against a backdrop that historically was unequal for so long, slavery and its, its consequences. It's an opinion that introduced really in a big way into the national lexicon this idea of diversity, which can mean all sorts of things, but, but it's Powell's opinion that, um, that really um, in, in injects that. Um, uh, that said, um, so and maybe using race to integrate is different than using race to segregate. It's you know maybe using race to to make sure that our great national universities look like America. Maybe that's not quite the same thing as using race to keep people um, who historically have um, been an underclass down and out. That's that's the argument we'd make if you were if you want to say affirmative action is okay. The intent of the framers of the Reconstruction Amendments is a little unclear and what that means 100 years later when we're dealing with people, even if they thought it was okay to do affirmative action, they were dealing with real slaves um, who had just been released from bondage, whether that's true 100 years later. So it's a very complicated set of issues. Uh, today, since you um, uh, asked me what, you know, if I were writing opinion, Way back when, I, I wrote a, a little piece um, with a then student um, in the New Republic. Um, uh, and uh, you were editing, I think, the New Republic um, uh, back then. I this, was not. I was just called an editor, but I had no editorial <laughs> responsibilities. But, <laughs> um, but the fellow I, I um, uh, co-wrote it with is a fellow named Neil Katyal, a brilliant student of mine. Um, I later introduced him to Jeff, and he's now Jeff's brother-in-law. Um, and if you, you know, want to read a little bit more about that, Neil and I wrote a piece um, uh, a little bit later called Baki's Fate, in which we argued that maybe race-conscious affirmative action was okay at least for a while, at least if very, very limited. That was 20, more than 20 years ago. It's a toxic business, this taking race into account, and Brother Paulson will maybe have some more things to say about that. So stay tuned, see that episode, because that still is a really important issue in, in current America. <laughs> okay, Mike, we're very eager for your response, but I want to ask you this. In their um, both majority and dissenting opinions in <clears throat> current affirmative action cases, originalist justices like Justice Thomas and others cite the language from Justice Harlan that you said earlier, our constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. And they uh, extract from that the proposition that any classification <laughs> on the basis of race, especially in affirmative action programs, is unconstitutional. But their critics say oh, they're being not good originalists because Harlan didn't say that all racial classifications are unconstitutional, only in regard to civil rights, our constitution is colorblind. And they then note that the framers of the constitution did not think that the right to go to public schools was a civil right, they said so. So therefore, Brown versus Board of Education was wrong on originalist grounds. And for that reason, it is bad originalism, these critics say, to invoke this Harlan language in the affirmative action cases. Discuss. Well, I was going to start out by saying that Akil was smarter in his 20s than he is in his 50s. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 he actually had it right at the time that we were law school roommates. Um, I actually think that the principle of the Constitution of colorblindness, that government may not regulate or classify or discriminate or distinguish on the basis of race ever, is the correct understanding. There are new instances in which that principle is applied, but the principle is the same, and I think that if you stick with the principle of Justice Harlan's dissent, you reach the right result. People disagree on affirmative action, but what I think is fascinating about the Bakke case is how it created 30 to 40 years of legal confusion. Just to, to reprise your, your short summary, four justices say colorblind, right? You cannot set aside slots in a medical school admissions class on the basis of race. These are for only one race. They say that is a principle that is that sounds an awful lot like segregation. And the strongest justice today who, for that position is Justice Thomas, the African-American justice on the Supreme Court. So four justices are pure colorblind 
principled people. Four justices adopt a, a version of Akeel in his 50s view, uh, which says that you can, uh, you can adopt affirmative act, that reverse discrimination is categorically different from direct discrimination against minorities, and that you can give quotas. They explicitly embrace quotas. The one justice in the middle, Justice Powell, says, well, no, quotas are unconstitutional, but a bonus or a diversity or a plus is OK. I think Akeel in his 20s was right, that basically a bonus, if it is meaningful, is a small quota and is just a smaller infringement of the same principle. But the really interesting thing is that eight justices agree that the one answer that can't be right is the answer in the middle, because all it will do is produce confusion as to the principle. And I think we've seen that for about 40 years in the Supreme Court's opinions. They still cannot agree as to whether or not the principle is race blind or that you can give preferences on the basis of race. And they've come up with these decisions in the middle that say, well, this is too much, this is too much, this is too much, this is, this is okay, this isn't, and it, it's just total quagmire. Uh, well, without settling that quagmire, we will now turn, we'll perform an intellectual arabesque and turn effortlessly to the First Amendment, if I can find my clicker. And even if I, here it is, let's read the First Amendment and inspire ourselves with its beautiful words. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And perhaps there's no modern case that better encapsulates our modern First Amendment tradition than our next case, Brandenburg versus Ohio, decided in 1969. This is an astonishing case which reminds us that America is a global outlier in insisting that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. I want you to remember that standard because that is the one that the Supreme Court embraced in Brandenburg. The speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Nothing short of an emergency can justify repression. These are words that come from Justice Louis Brandeis's inspiring opinion in Whitney versus California, where he says that because the final end of the state is to make men free to develop their faculties, the best response to evil counsels is good ones, and as long as there's time enough to deliberate, then every idea, no matter how hateful, has to be admitted into the public sphere. There is a huge debate in this country today about whether the First Amendment should protect hate speech. A recent Brookings poll found that a majority of undergraduates think that it does not. But when you are asked, you can tell people confidently that the Supreme Court in Brandenburg and in decisions ever since has said by overwhelming majorities, the First Amendment does protect hate speech and can only allow speech to be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. The facts of Brandenburg are striking. It involves a Ku Klux Klan rally. And a guy actually gets up wearing a Klan uniform at a rally and says, unless something happens to the race situation in this country, white people are gonna have to take revengeance. And he is prosecuted under an Ohio criminal syndicalism law, which makes it illegal to advocate crime, sabotage, violence, or unlawful methods of terrorism as a means of accomplishing industrial or political reform. And the court remarkably holds that this speech, which is hateful and appalling, and the guys in a Klan uniform at the rally, is protected by the First Amendment because it is not directed or in, uh, at inciting or producing imminent lawless action, and it's not likely to incite or produce the action. It's a willing rally of Klan people. They're not going to riot. They're just hearing hate speech that they agree with, and there's no danger of violence. A remarkable principle, Akeel. It does come from Brandeis. Why did the court embrace it in 69, having uh, you know, come out on the other way for uh, so long? And is it correct? Do you believe that Brandenburg and Brand Brandeis, who was channeling Jefferson and the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, are right as an originalist matter? And what else should the audience know about Brandenburg? I'm a fierce believer in very, very broad political speech. Um, and um, and I don't try to uh, shelter my own students from um, hearing uh, sharp critiques of their worldview. 
Why did it take so, and, and Yale is not governed by the Constitution, it's a private institution, um, but the free speech idea is even broader than the First Amendment. It's, it's about how we as a society, we actually have to be willing to confront um, ideas that we might not like and figure out why we don't like them. We will sharpen our own views when we hear um, the other uh, side. Now, why did it take so long? It's not a unique story about the First Amendment. So we've heard, for example, that the 14th Amendment really did promise racial equality, but that's not what we got in Plessy versus Ferguson, and that was only, you know, that only happened later in Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, we heard that Congress is really authorized to pass sweeping civil rights laws, uh, but, but actually the court initially in the 1883 cases didn't get it right, finally did, although not on reconstruction power grounds, but on interstate commerce grounds. So, um, I believe that these, the words that were up, up on the screen before, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. The core idea there is no state can violate fundamental rights. No state can violate things in the Bill of Rights like speech, press, petition, and assembly. Oh, but it took the Supreme Court a very long time to actually uh, catch up to that. In general, um, Congress passes uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, yes, actually Congress gives us, uh, the first Congress, the words of the First Amendment, and then what happens within a decade? Congress passes a law making it a crime to criticize, you guessed it, Congress, with the Sedition Act of 1798, and courts willingly uphold that. So there, there's a lot that the Constitution actually says, and then courts actually don't initially implement and then only later do they finally, finally, finally catch up to it. Um, Mike might say that about affirmative action. Um, uh, when he thinks that it's prohibited and courts aren't prohibiting it now, but he's hopeful that that day will, will come. So what explains that? Because it's not unique to hate speech. I would say that many of the ideas in the Constitution are truly radical ideas. Um, amazing, radical in a good sense, and it takes sometimes America a long time to actually catch up to these commitments and promises that really are in the text. And because they really are in the text in the end, they prevail in the long run because people take seriously what's in the text of the Constitution in the very long run, in part because there are great institutions like the National Constitution Center <laughs> and C-SPAN that are designed to actually reintroduce you to these amazing words and principles. So thanks for the plug, Akil. Um, and uh, Mike. Oh, and books like Brother Paulson's The books Constitution like Brother Paulson's. and Introduction. And this is probably a good time for me to plug this wonderful book by Tony Morrow, Landmark Cases, Volume 2, which uh, will review all of these wonderful cases and which you can get uh, online and here at the National Constitution Center. And Mike, uh, I guess two questions about Brandenburg. First, is Akil descriptively right that the reason that the court recognized this free speech principle in the 60s it was the Vietnam War. And suddenly protest is much more uh, popular and the justices are sensitive to it. Whereas at the time the Sedition Act of 1798 or of 1917 were passed during World War I and at the time of the framing, those prosecutions were much less popular. And then I just wanna ask you, was Brandenburg and is Brandeis correct as an originalist matter? The Constitution Center is gonna have such a cool debate at, in next month in Boston Justice Breyer will speak, it's the, the Edward Kennedy Library, but Judd Campbell is a brilliant scholar who's just written a piece for the Yale Law Journal saying as an originalist matter, really the First Amendment was supposed to protect core political speech, but maybe some restrictions on hate speech are okay. So I really wanna know, is Brandenburg correct as an originalist matter? Well, okay, that's a big complicated question. I'll try to give a succinct answer. I think Brandenburg is right. I think that hate speech tests our commitment to the principle of freedom of speech. If we truly believe in the freedom of speech, we have to believe in the freedom of people to express views no matter how unpopular and how unreasonable they seem to the overwhelming majority of people, short of, and this is Brandenburg's line, immediate incitement to imminent lawlessness. Right? In the world after Charlottesville, it's hard to know exactly where that line is, but the line that is drawn in uh, the Brandenburg case is that you can't punish speech 
based upon its offensiveness. That means we have to protect the broadest sphere. So Akhil and I are actually both free speech liberals. I reach that result as a matter of, not of policy, not because I like speech. I do like speech, but I don't like all speech, right? But I think that it is correct as a matter of the original meaning of the Constitution. It is true that the purpose of the framers, the core purpose of the First Amendment was to protect core political speech. But I think that the words that they wrote, the freedom of speech, are broader than the principle. They were overbroad in protecting speech. They go beyond what European societies do, and I think it is something true and distinctive to America. Whether it took the Supreme Court too long to get there, I think could be fairly debated. The Supreme Court has not always been a vigorous protector of free speech, and some of the most awful decisions of the Supreme Court came in affirming convictions for sedition, for, for outrageous speech. In fact, one of the cases mentioned in the, the book I wrote with my son, Luke, um, is a case called Debs versus United States. Eugene, versus, Eugene Debs was a socialist pres presidential candidate in a variety of elections in the early 1900s. He was basically prosecuted and convicted and incarcerated for a harsh anti-World War I policy speech. Can you imagine that? Incarcerating a presidential candidate for a political speech. The Supreme Court upheld that. Whether it took the Vietnam War to break the barrier and actually give us free speech, I, I think is a fascinating question of a sociological matter. But I'm just a dumb lawyer. I don't know that I can answer th that descriptively. The Debs precedent is amazing. And Debs runs for president in 1920 from a jail cell. That and gets a million votes. It, and gets a million votes. An absolutely astonishing story and an inspiring story of constitutional uh, 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 I won't say evolution, I'll say of, 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 of justices of different perspectives coming to recognize the insight of Jefferson and Madison that speech is a natural right that comes from God or nature and not from government and can't be, our freedom of opinion can't be alienated or surrendered to government under any circumstance because our opinions are the product of our reason and as creatures of the Enlightenment we can't alienate our reason to the state uh, because it defines who we are as human beings. That's okay. what he wrote in his student note in the Yale Law no, Journal that's way what, back when. No, that is what uh, Madison... Yeah, no, and, but, yeah, wait, but well, both, both are true. Well, I think Madison had it first. <laughs> <laughs> much, uh, all right, we have another First Amendment speech, uh, and it involves student protests. It's called Tinker versus Des Moines, 1969, still the height of the Vietnam era, and here some students are deciding to protest what's going on in the public sphere. We're about to have a march on Washington of students who are not happy with our current uh, gun control policy. And in 1969, it was the Vietnam War and students come to school wearing black armbands to punish and protest the war. And the question is, can they be suspended by the Des Moines School District for their armbands? They say that this violates their freedom of speech and in a seven to <coughs> two majority opinion by Justice Fortas, the court says students can't be punished for their passive expression of opinion the ban on armbands is an urgent wish to avoid controversy. It can hardly be argued that students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. A memorable phrase, even students do have First Amendment rights. That notion is being challenged today by the internet. Where's the schoolhouse gate if you're texting at home and texts that are received in school, and what to make of recent Supreme Court decisions, uh, including those upholding bans on a banner saying bong hits for Jesus on the grounds <laughs> that they might disrupt school discipline. So uh, Akhil, doctrinally, how important was Tinker? What's the, was it correct? And, what, and, and is the court right or wrong to be cutting back on it in more recent cases? Well, um, this one's personal for me. Uh, I think I do what I do um, in part because my parents brought me to Philadelphia when I was 11 years old and I went to Independence Hall and that made a tremendous impact on me. But then three years later, four years later, I'm in high school um, and I um, uh, uh, write an op-ed for the school newspaper that the principal censors uh, and my teachers stood by me 
and they told me to read this case called Tinker versus Des Moines, which is all about the free speech rights of students. And I read it, and it really inspired me, and I think it changed my life. And, um, and I tell that story in a, in a chapter that I wrote in a book called The Law of the Land about Tinker versus Des Moines. So, so this is a case about students, about you know, the next generation. All I can tell you is for me, when I was a student, it really inspired me to, to take the Constitution seriously, to take rights seriously. Um, it's what the National Constitution Center is all about. It's great to see at least one youngster right here in the third row, so thanks for, for coming. This space is all about, I think two thirds of the people who come here on a, just a daily basis actually are um, youngsters <coughs> learning about the Constitution. And for me, that's what Tinker versus Des Moines was. That's a beautiful story. This was a spectacular President's Day with thousands of young people, so inspiring. Um, but Mike, you know, Akil has given us this powerful personal story, but these more recent cases do suggest that students have fewer First Amendment rights than adults, and Justice Thomas suggested in a very uh, uh, provocative opinion that as an original matter, students had no First Amendment rights at all. So is Tinker correct or is Justice Thomas correct? Uh, Tinker is a great case. I love the Tinker case. E even though it protected Akil, I would have liked to have seen him suspended by high school. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, but I, I don't have a story like that, but uh, one of my first jobs out of law school was working in defense of religious freedom for high school students who wanted to form prayer groups or Bible studies after school in the same terms as the chess club or the underwater basket weaving club or whatever it was. And the case that we cited more than anything else was Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District. Even though it was a religious freedom case, we weren't relying on the religious freedom provisions, but saying, look, this is just the expression of views, and you can't discriminate on the basis of the fact that it's religious speech, and so we use Tinker as the main case. It, it's true that the Supreme Court has been chipping back on it a couple of decisions. Uh, the, there are greater restrictions that have been upheld on the decorum of student speech and whether it's offensive. If something occurs within a curricular context, the speech kind of becomes more the school speech and it's easier to regulate. I actually disagree with that too. I disagree with the bong hits for Jesus case. Now you say, what is this? Okay, a, a snotty nosed high school senior, a man <laughs> after my own heart and Akil's apparently too, <clears throat> uh, shows up for, I think it's the, a parade in Alaska as the Olympic torch is going through town. And they're actually dismissed from school that day. He actually doesn't show up for school. He goes straight to the parade and unfurls this banner that says, Bong Hits for Jesus. He's just a kid, right? He's just, he's just being a wiseacre. There's no message in it. But they actually uphold the expulsion or suspension of him from school um, on the basis of what he does at a parade. Now, I no more like his speech than, than I would like some other, other speech I disagree with, but I think that the basic principle that kids are persons <laughs> and are possessed with free speech rights it is a vital and correct principle. The First Amendment is not limited to adults. So kids out there, go press your freedom of speech and the legitimate, the legitimate bounds of it is it can't be disruptive to the school environment and it can't interfere with the rights of other students to be secure and to have a good education. But short of that, you get to express your views and that that's your constitutionally protected right. So go out and use it. Beautiful. New York Times versus United States, the Pentagon Papers case. Uh, who's seen the Post movie? It's great, uh, go see it. And this case is crucial to the movie uh, where President Nixon is using his executive authority to try to prevent the New York Times from publishing these top secret documents related to the Vietnam War. And as we know from the movie, they've been leaked by Daniel Ellsberg, who worked for the Department of Defense. And uh, in the movie, it's Catherine Graham, the publisher of The Post, who makes the brave decision to publish, despite the recommendations of her all-male lawyers. And she, at the same time, is trying to figure out what the New York Times will do 
a lower court judge has actually stopped the presses. For the first time in American history, the presses have been stopped by someone who fears that the exposure of the information might be dangerous to national security. Another judge refuses to stop the presses and is very proud of that, and it's all up to the Supreme Court. And as we learned from the movie, the First Amendment protected the right of the New York Times to publish the papers, and Justice Black wrote uh, one of his most memorable decisions saying that the word security should not be used to abrogate the fundamental law embodied in the First Amendment. Akhil, what is the legal principle that justified uh, Justice Black's holding? Was it correct as an originalist matter? And uh, uh, was there a decent case on the other side? First Amendment talks about freedom, the, f the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. And those were two slightly different things at the time of the framing. Um, and of course, the 14th Amendment makes these things applicable, applicable, these rights against state and local governments, like Des Moines, um, Iowa, for example. But freedom of speech comes from freedom of speech and debate um, in Parliament. Parliament is a place where people speak, from French parler to speak, and it's about very broad political discourse. And in England, Parliament gets to do that. In America, everyone gets to do that because we're sovereign. We're the parliament, all of us, the uh, citizens. So that's a very broad political expression, which is what Mike and I defend. Um, and that's the Brandenburg case. Uh, uh, now, freedom of the press, the press there didn't mean the media. It actually meant a machine, like the printing presses, stop the presses. Um, and the idea was, um, in England, you see, a printing press used to be a pretty expensive, pricey piece of equipment. Not everyone had one. Today, you all do. It's called your laptop you know, or your iPhone. Um, but back then, at the, at the, in, the, uh, uh, in the century before the Constitution, it was a very big, heavy piece of equipment. And uh, the government of England thought that it could license it. It could decide who could get a printing press and who couldn't. And, and freedom of the press um, was this idea that actually um, government shouldn't be allowed to license. You could print what you want. Oh, but if the government didn't like what you print, maybe you could be punished after the fact. This came to be in America, uh, it, it, uh, in the First Amendment, it came uh, to be associated with this idea of no prior restraint, OK? The government can't license a printing press, can't have censorship rules in advance. Printers get to publish. Now, if they publish stuff, that compromises a legitimate government interest. There's a possibility of punishment after the fact, but we can't stop the presses by <coughs> government fiat. Now, in that after the fact punishment, one other thing you need to understand is who's going to decide whether these words were really, I'm not just a judge on his own, her own, but a jury is going to have to decide. A jury of your peers who are actually going to see what it is that you uh, published and whether that actually was uh, contributed to, to um, uh, national the debate or, or, or not. But, but the Pentagon Papers case, it's a narrower one. It's a great, uh, I haven't seen the movie, but it's, you know, it's a great story. But it only stands for the proposition that the government can't stop the presses in advance. But the court actually acknowledges there's a possibility that once the New York Times and the Washington Post publish this, oh, there could be prosecutions afterwards. So they were very gutsy to not actually um, ref uh, hold back and to actually um, uh, uh, publish, because they were at risk of after the fact punishment under the free press clause, which is, again, only a rule of no prior restraint. Now, the free speech clause is much broader. So that's an important wrinkle. In the movie, uh, Catherine Graham is worried about being put in jail for conspiracy because both she and the Times relied on the same source. Uh, Mike, um, is that the correct originalist principle? You can't be stopped from publishing before the fact, but you can be punished after the fact? If so, why didn't the Nixon administration try to punish after the fact? Or do you believe that, that the natural rights uh, vision of the First Amendment would prohibit publication even after the fact? That's a really tough question of whether the First Amendment <clears throat> would permit pub, uh, <clears throat> criminal prosecution of someone for publishing the disclosure of national security secrets. 
that's not something that's decided by the Pentagon Papers case. It's interesting to see <clears throat> this case came up on a super fast track. I think it was two weeks from the beginning of the publication of the Pentagon Papers to the time it's decided by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court does it in rapid fire fashion. The, the movie captures this wonderfully. I can't believe a law professor hasn't gone and seen a case. <laughs> <clears throat> Seen a movie about a Supreme Court case. Kids at home. Yeah. <laughs> Parental Take them. duties. Take them, they'll love it. But uh, there's a range of opinions from the First Amendment to absolutists that say government cannot restrict whatever this, the press publishes. To Brennan's opinion, Justice William Brennan, that says, you know, they might be able to restrict publication of national security secrets of the sort analogous to letting Hitler know where the D-Day invasion is going to be, right? That there are compelling interest overrides to a middle block of justices who say, We're not, we, we don't need to decide that because one principle that's, that's firm is that the government may not shut down the press in advance. And here, Congress hadn't passed a law mm. authorizing Nixon to seek the injunction that he did, that getting a court order stopping the presses is not only a First Amendment violation, but a separation of powers violation. The president is asking the court to write us a law that Congress didn't write. They said, give us the case where Congress has passed a law and we might come out differently. Now, there have been cases like that. Um, I think there was an instance sometime in the early 2000s, might have been 2006 or 2007, where the New York Times disclosed our signals intelligence operation, something about the NSA wiretapping program. Now say what you will about the validity of the wiretapping program, the disclosure of the intelligence gathering information public did violate the specific criminal statute. And it is an open question, not decided by the Supreme Court, whether you could criminally prosecute the press for disclosing a vital national security secret. I think the gravitational force of the New York Times case has created a political atmosphere where within hugely broad bounds, uh, we do not go after the press for publishing things even where the statute seemed to say that we could. Wonderful. All right, we have two more cases and the next one involves the Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Our case is Gideon versus Wainwright, which held that criminal defendants have the right to an attorney even if they can't afford one on their own. If you want to learn the human stories behind Gideon and Wainwright, Read Anthony Lewis's beautiful good book, Gideon's Trumpet, which inspired a generation to go to law school to defend the defenseless. And it's an astonishing story. I won't ruin it except to say that Gideon, who handwrites his own petition to the Supreme Court saying that he had a right to a lawyer, ends up uh, getting one and being retried and being found innocent. And I wish I could take out Lewis's book, but I'm gonna take out the Kindle because I love to read the last paragraph of the book when I teach criminal procedure because it's so moving. And you just have a sense of the incredible journey that Gideon traveled to be made free after asserting his constitutional rights. After nearly two years in the state penitentiary, Gideon was a free man. There were tears in his eyes and he trembled even more than usual as he stood in a circle of well-wishers and discussed his plans. His half-brother, the Air Force Sergeant, was coming home from Japan and would adopt Gideon's children. That night, he would pay a last triumphant visit to the Bay Harbor pool room. Could someone <laughs> let him have a few dollars? <laughs> someone did. This is Anthony Lewis. Do you feel like you're, you accomplished something? A newspaper reporter asked. Well, I did. Akil, what was the doctrinal principle that says that you have a right to have the state pay for you to have a lawyer. How does that square with the history of the Sixth Amendment? Why did it take the court so long and was Gideon uh, correct? So it says the right of counsel in the Constitution and after the 14th Amendment, that fundamental right, as with all the others, comes to apply against the states. The counter is, oh, counsel only if you can pay for it. It's not government. Uh, appointed counsel. Well, it's not so clear. At the founding, actually, it is true that in capital cases in America, the, the government paid for private counsel, but in non-capital cases, it didn't. 
On the other hand, the, th the fiction was, in a non-capital case, you did have the benefit of legal counsel. That was called the judge. And the judge, actually, if you couldn't afford counsel, would look after your interests. And the judge is paid for by the government, you know, last time I checked. So that actually <laughs> was a form of government um, sponsored, uh, government subsidized counsel. Over time, it came to be clear that the judge can't be both the umpire and um, the coach for, for the defendant's team. You can't wear both hats at once. So one idea is Gideon, the case, is just actually um, pr changing the precise way in which the government provides your counsel, not through a judge, but through um, a, a public defender, uh, publicly subsidized. That's one argument. Here's a different argument. Whatever else it says, the Constitution provides for due process, which is about fair procedures. And there's just an intolerable risk of unfairness that an innocent person could actually be found guilty, not because he's guilty, but because he's just not particularly learned in the law. And hey, he can't defend himself well in the jury trial with rules of evidence and all the rest. So he's, there's an intolerable risk that someone's going to be convicted, not because they're guilty, but just because they're poor. And that's not fair procedure, not due process of law. And as society becomes wealthier over time, maybe we c it's more fair to insist that we provide more government uh, resources, especially because government is pouring more money into prosecution than it used to before. So that's a second argument, and one that does depend in part on uh, over time, uh, how, how the prosecution function is changing, how government is become, how society is becoming wealthier. Now, here's one final point. It's a counting point. At the time of Gideon, 45 of the 50 states, as a matter of state law, were already giving all felony defendants um, uh, appointed counsel. And Justice Black's landmark opinion for the court in Gideon mentions that prominently. That's a counting idea. Um, and even the five that weren't, all of which were in the former Confederacy, always gave um, uh, counsels for capital defendants and actually in big cities and, and even they gave uh, uh, counsel to a lot of people, just not, not every felony defendant. 25 states filed am amicus briefs in the case, 22 of them on behalf of Clarence Earl Gideon. So actually, um, most of the states were very much on board with this principle, and you see the John Marshall Harlan count, uh, the second, the younger, counting principle at issue in this one as well. Okay, Mike, I heard a lot of evolution in there. I heard counting, <laughs> I heard the function of government changing, I heard a lot of, and I saw a little, uh, some, some hand waving, hand -waving <laughs> stuff like that. So as an original matter, at the time of the framing, uh, some states banned defendants from having counsel because of the vestiges of an old system uh, where there was no counsel and you weren't sworn under oath and people weren't allowed to uh, t uh, testify in their own words. But um, the, at the very least, the Sixth Amendment was trying to allow you to have counsel if you could afford it. Was the court correct to hold in the 60s that even if you couldn't afford it, the state had to provide one? Or was Gideon wrong as an originalist matter? Gideon was right. And I think the principle is, is actually a pretty simple one. Um, if if still arguable and debatable, I think that the right to counsel, the right to have assistance of counsel for defense is an affirmative right. It's not merely a right of government, not to have government forbid you from having a lawyer, but it is a right to have a lawyer. And I think it's an entirely plausible reading of that, that in situations where someone can't afford one, uh, that the government would provide appointed counsel. So I, I, I'm a fan of Gideon. Our last case. Cats versus U.S., and it's time for the Fourth Amendment. I'm going to put it on the screen, but I think I can do the <clears> beginning of the Fourth Amendment by heart as a party trick. See if I'm getting it right. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And the central idea of the Fourth Amendment is to repudiate the hated general warrants and writs of assistance that sparked the American Revolution. At the time of the framing, you had to break into someone's house and violate their private property rights to violate the Fourth Amendment. And as late as the 1920s, at the dawn of the age of the wires, the Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, written by that underappreciated constitutional hero, William Howard Taft, held <laughs> that without physical <clears throat> trespass, there was no Fourth Amendment violation. In that case, the Olmstead 
Bishop case, the wiretaps were put under a public sidewalk leading up to the suspected bootlegger's office, and Taft said, no trespass, no Fourth Amendment problem. In his visionary dissenting opinion, Justice Brandeis disagreed. He predicted that ways may someday be developed by which it's possible without physically intruding into the home to extract secret papers and introduce them in court. He anticipated fMRI mind reading technologies, which would <laughs> allow the expression of unexpressed thoughts, sensations, and emotions, and said that the Fourth Amendment should apply even without physical trespass. The Katz case is significant because it recognized Brandeis's insight and said the Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. Katz involved an ancient technology from long ago called a phone booth. <laughs> Who remembers phone booths? Wow, that was less than a quarter of the audience. That was about 20% of the audience remembers the phone booths. I do. You used to have to go inside them, and you could close the glass door behind you and talk on the phone. And the court in this case said, because the suspected gambler, Katz, closed the door, he manifested a subjective expectation of privacy that society was prepared to accept as reasonable. Those were Justice Harlan, again, his the words and his, the younger Harlan's in his concurring opinion, is there a subjective expectation of privacy that society is prepared to accept as reasonable? There is so much to say about that test, including the fact that it seems really circular. If the government says, citizens, we're gonna track your GPS devices door to door, then our expectations of privacy are diminished and so would our constitutional protections. And this term in the Carpenter case, the court may determine the future of electronic privacy by deciding whether or not CATS applies to the tracking of our movements in public based on seizing our cell phone records for five months. Akhil, uh, you have written so powerfully about the Fourth Amendment and the general warrants. Was it correct as an originalist matter? Uh, who had the better uh, opinion, Justice Stewart and his majority, or Justice Harlan, or if you were writing Katz from a textualist and originalist point of view, would you decide it on other grounds? Well, I have a broad understanding of what counts as a search or a seizure triggering the Fourth Amendment. We don't quite live in the same physical universe. Um, People um, can be intruded upon without a physical trespass using uh, electronic surveillance techniques. So I like the idea of a broad reading of search and seizure. I would say that when you read the words of the Fourth Amendment, all that it means when there's a search or seizure is that it has to be reasonable. The court sometimes says, oh, if there's a search or seizure, it has to, there has to be a warrant, which I don't think is true. And it isn't true actually for all sorts of searches and seizures. Metal detectors in airports are searches and seizures. They don't have warrants. If you're stopped and frisked on a street, that's a search or seizure. Um, it doesn't have a, a, a warrant. So, so I would have a broad understanding of what counts as a Fourth Amendment episode. Um, but I think that all that that requires is governmental reasonableness rather than a warrant. Um, uh, the warrants that were, um, that were generated after the Katz case, uh, wiretap warrants are issued by courts in secret. It's going to lead to FISA warrants, which are also issued in secret. I don't love the idea of courts acting in secret. I, they, they tend not to act so well when they, they, they act secretly rather than in open court, so I don't love that. And now here's where I'm really kooky. The framers of the Fourth Amendment uh, did not believe in an exclusionary rule. So even if the Fourth Amendment was violated, if actual evidence of guilt was found that was actually admissible. Here's a quote from a famous case. It matters not how you get it. If you steal it even, it would be admissible. So, um, and that's not Brandeis's view. You're a real Brandeis enthusiast. He thought that, um, uh, that it obviously followed that if the government violated the Fourth Amendment, that evidence would need to be excluded. Only problem is that no founder said that. No founder actually ever thought that. No court in America, state or federal, and remember states have state constitutions with little Fourth Amendments that apply against state government. No court in America ever excluded evidence um, in a kind of exclusionary rule-like way in the entire century after the Declaration of Independence. So, you know, an eclectic set of views, broad understanding of, uh, first, of Fourth Amendment, what tr triggers it, but only reasonableness is required. I'm not sure that judges issuing secret warrants are always the best way to go. And, and I don't love the exclusionary rule, which, by the way, doesn't help you at all if you're innocent. <laughs>
Because if you're innocent, they don't find anything, and they've still intruded upon you. So I prefer a regime, which is the founder's regime. When you're intruded on, sue them for damages. Have a jury decide, a jury of your peers, sock it to them. Um, and the more innocent you are, the more you recover, and good for you. <clears throat> Mike, the recent electronic privacy cases have often been unanimous. The court has held by nine to zero votes that putting a GPS device on the bottom of someone's car or seizing their cell phone on arrest without a warrant violates the Fourth Amendment. But the more conservative originalist justices focus on private property violations. That was the problem in the GPS case where they walked in the guy's driveway and stuck the GPS device on the bottom of his car. In Katz, was there a property violation to peg on or uh, was Katz wrong from an originalist matter? Well, I, I think Katz is right from an originalist perspective, but, but I think with all respect, Jeff, I think you, you're wrong about the conservative justices. Some of them have found Fourth Amendment violations Absolutely. where there's a specific intrusion on a property right or a physical intrusion. But one of my favorite Fourth Amendment cases to teach is one that I believe is called Kylo, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which is written by Justice Scalia. And there's never a more pure, original meaning textualist than Justice Scalia. He was just relentless on this and served wonderfully for 30 years in the Supreme Court. This was a case about the use of infrared technology to look into people's houses. And the question presented was whether that was a search. And he said, the fact that it was not a technology known at the time does not alter the fact that it is intruding into the areas of the home where people, you know, it is a search of the home. It actually matches the literal re, uh, words of the, first, of the Fourth Amendment. I think similarly, to, to seize somebody's phone conversations, to wiretap, is a seizure. Sure, it was not a technology known at the time, but it's just an illustration that the Constitution's terms sometimes embrace new instances that fit into traditional categories. So I, I think that actually, from an originalist point of view, Katz is clearly right that wiretapping somebody's conversations is a search. It is a seizure of the conversations. I actually agree with an astonishing amount of what Akhil said about the Fourth Amendment. It, it's a prohibition on unreasonable searches, not a prohibition on searches per se. Not all searches require warrants, and Akhil has adopted the wonderfully conservative view that the Fourth Amendment itself does not provide an exclusionary rule. The Fourth Amendment is traditionally about damages remedies, suing police officers for intrusions upon your rights, not about excluding evidence. There really is no clear textual reason in the Constitution why the police's error or mistake, or even willful mistake, should result in the exclusion of evidence at a trial. They should be sued for damages, but I think that that's not a reason why the guilty should go free just because the constable blundered. Well, this is a wonderful place to end. First, it shows that two old friends with very different approaches may converge on constitutional results. And as you remind us, justices uh, like Justice Alito and Justice Scalia, who often agree on the result, may diverge on the methodology in Fourth Amendment cases. Uh, because they uh, have different views about how the Constitution should be translated in light of new technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, here is your homework as you get ready to enjoy this incredible series of 12 landmark cases. Uh, first, I want you to dig into the text of the Constitution, and I do want you to download, if you haven't already, the National Constitution Center's amazing interactive Constitution which you can find in the App Store. You can click on each of these amendments and see the leading liberal and conservative scholars in America, such as Akhil and Mike, with a thousand words on what they agree the provision means and then separate statements about what they disagree. It is an inspiring civic and educational feast and it'll get you ready to think about the cases. Then I want you to read the opinions. You don't have to read all of it. You can skim. Every law student learns this. But read, <laughs> read the majority opinion, read the dissents, then listen to the human stories, hear the amazing, inspiring, brave lawyers on both sides who made their arguments, and then at the end, you make up your own mind, and be open to the possibility of separating your political from your constitutional conclusions. Be open to the possibility that you might think that searches of the uh, conversations are a bad idea, but the Fourth Amendment prohibits it, 
or they're a good idea, but the Fourth Amendment allows it. That's what it means to think like a constitutional lawyer. That's what I learned from Akhil so many years ago in that wonderful class. That's what the two of you learned when you were students, debating each other, caring so much about the meaning of the Constitution, recognizing that it is made for people of fundamentally differing points of view, as Justice Holmes said. And that's what the Constitution Center is about. That's what C-SPAN is about. That's why we're so excited about this series and so thrilled to share it with you. Thanks to our friends at C-SPAN, and see you next week. Thank you so much.